We ready? Yep. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce for interview uh, for senior lawyers, Felix Briones. Felix has been in Farmington uh, and in practice in Farmington for 50 years. Uh, it's my job to uh, talk to Felix about uh, his life in general. And I think a place to start, Felix, is to tell us uh, your history, specifically where you were born and raised. Thank you, Dick. Well, I was born in Carlsbad, New Mexico. Went through high school there. Attended UNM undergraduate and law school. I went into the Air Force and to the JAG for a couple of years and then came to Farmington. I'm going to back you up and ask you about schooling in Carlsbad, if that's all right. Uh, you, you attended uh, 12 years of school at Carlsbad High? Yes. Or in Carlsbad? In Carlsbad. Were there any events in high school that, uh, that helped you make a decision to practice law? Well, th there was one event that probably is the single most um, moving event, probably, or activity that I've been involved in. Um, we lived um, next door to Carver School, which was um, the then equal but uh, separate school for the blacks in uh, Carlsbad. I had a friend who was my age and who went to school there. I used to play basketball with him on the basketball outdoor court. And uh, I was also the president of the student body at uh, Carlsbad. And, um, talked the council into uh, seeking to get integration and um, we went to the principal then the superintendent and they permitted the student council to do a um, study it was obvious that there was not equal we were separate but clearly not equal so the student council moved strongly to urge them to uh, integrate which they did, and um, it, it was a wonderful experience to have my friend Bobby uh, march in our um, graduation in 1951. And I suppose that's probably the single thing that uh, impressed me about the importance of doing things to help people, which probably helped me form an idea of going to law school. Uh, and if I may remind you that was well before Brown versus Board of Education, wasn't it? It was. In those days, uh, Carlsbad, Roswell, Hobbs, uh, that whole area was uh, a segregated area of uh, schools. And yes, it was well before that. Tell me what uh, outside activities you had other than schooling during your formative years in Carlsbad. Well, my father was a rancher. He and his brother, my uncle Jose, were uh, partners in, in a small ranch and that was um, a lot of fun to help on the roundups and to ride horses. My father had a uh, Shetland pony or a horse for me and my siblings uh, and my cousins uh, all the time it seemed like and so that was a lot of uh, fun and, and things that I enjoyed doing. I'm surprised I don't have a horse today but probably 40 percent of the art that hangs in my house has horses <laughs> in the in the art but uh, uh, in addition I worked um, while I was in high school at Hermosa Grocery and uh, felt like that was one of the most formative kind of positive things in my life because it gave me a, an opportunity to meet people to serve them and to uh, see what it was like to deal with people which I enjoy doing. Did you have, uh, you did have some idea, but did you have a definite idea of what you wanted to do when you graduated from high school? Not really, it's sort of a vague idea. My um, teacher, Des De Beckley, who was the debate teacher, encouraged me to go to law school. And I didn't know a thing about it. I had no family members who were lawyers, didn't even know lawyers. And um, it, so it was an idea that stuck with me, and I decided that uh, I would look into it. And, uh, you know, that's what sort of got the ball rolling. Speaking of history, I, I know a story about debate uh, that may involve another member of, of the bar in New Mexico. Uh, would you share that story with us? 
Um, Justice Frank Keeney, may his soul rest in peace, recently died. Um, Gene and I were in high school at the same time. He went to uh, St. Mary's High School in Albuquerque, and I met him at the state debate tournament held in Albuquerque a couple of years in a row, and and it led to a lifetime friendship that uh, was very special to me. It is, after all, a small state, isn't it? It really is, yes. Um, I might say that um, Gene always maintained that they beat Carlsbad, and we may, I maintain that we beat St. Mary's, but uh, uh, my son Paul recently said, well, you've got the last word now. Because that's, that's true. <laughs> well, I understand that Paul actually asked Justice Fran Keeney one time uh, who won those debates, and he insisted it was St. Mary's and himself. Right? That's right. That's what, that's what Paul tells me. <laughs> when you entered college, did you start UNM? Yes. What was your undergraduate major? In uh, general business. It, it started out to be accounting, and I took many hours of accounting until I learned that they insisted that everything come out to the penny, and that just didn't seem <laughs> like something I wanted to do with my career. Did you have any idea when you started undergraduate school that uh, it might lead to law school? Well, I was hoping it would. By then, it was sort of an idea that I was pursuing, and the only thing that I think was going to hold me back was the cost. You know, I had a very small amount of money that I'd saved up working at Hermosa Grocery, and at the end of my freshman year, I'd had such a great year, I'd enjoyed it so much. Um, I was president of the freshman class, I was involved in a fraternity, I uh, had uh, been, I joined the debate team, and I mean, it was just a wonderful year, and I, I'd made good grades. I, just, I resolved that, you know, I may not be able to come back next year because of the money, but I will be back. I mean, it had been that kind of an impression on me. And did you, were you able to make it back? Yes, I did, uh, thanks to my employer to keep me employed and uh, work me on holidays and vacations and that sort of thing, uh, summer breaks, uh, I was able to, you know, in those days, Dick, a $20 bill went a long ways, and I could run to see my folks after the four weeks exams, for example, and uh, work immediately when I got home on a Friday evening, get a couple hours, then all day Saturday, and then drive back Sunday with uh, other friends that went down there. That was a big help. Did you work anywhere other than Carlsbad for the grocery during undergraduate days? Well, no, not in Carlsbad, but I did work in Albuquerque. Um, I had um, a job as um, a janitor. I took care of an engineering office, which uh, I'd always been an early riser, and I could go in early in the morning, get the bus on Central, go downtown, sweep up, etc., and get back in time to uh, have something to eat and go to, to class. I also worked with uh, Mossman Gladden Construction, helping them build houses and eventually helping them also on the weekends to show the homes there in Albuquerque um, to, to, you know, try to interest people that come, came to the open houses. Did you have any professors in undergraduate school that, that guided you or kicked you toward law school? Not that I can remember, no. I, that was not something that any body at the undergraduate had an impact on, I don't think. Did you go directly into law school from undergraduate school? I did, and in those days, there was a six-year program, Dick. Uh, you could do three years undergraduate, three years of law school, and get a dual degree, and that's what I did. Okay, so you actually did not get your bachelor's degree until after your first year in law school? In fact, it was after my second year. I had a call from my um, uh, dean of the business school to say that uh, I went in to see him and he said, you lack one course in history that um, you haven't completed for your undergraduate, but I, I propose to waive that for you. And I said, don't do it yet. Wait till after my second year of law school <laughs> because I was also in ROTC and I didn't want to have to ask for two years extension to active duty. He, he uh, by, uh, you know, uh, helped me by doing that. I only had to sweat out whether he'd still be there <laughs> in another year, but it worked out fine. Uh, what, uh, what branch of the service? The, the Air Force. 
Okay. Yeah. And when you completed uh, law school, you then uh, had to complete your ROTC commitment? Yes, I had a two-year commitment and I served at Amarillo Air Force Base, Texas, which no longer exists, but nevertheless, that's where it was. Uh, what was your job or MOS when you were in the service? Well, I was in the JAG, and um, my specific job was uh, they assigned me to be the staff judge advocate of the 3320th Retraining Group. The retraining group was um, in existence not too many years before that, and deserving prisoners in the minds of their commanders would be sent to this re retraining center. And there they would um, receive training to get back onto active duty. They weren't confined like uh, prisoners usually are. They, you couldn't tell by seeing them on the um, base that they were in fact uh, prisoners. So I would help them do some of their appeal work to the Court of Military Appeals and we would also give um, legal advice. In addition, um, I did my share of the trials that were mostly AWOL trials, um, but it was wonderful because we were in court at least three days a week. Uh, there were so many of those AWOL cases that we had to try. There were others, real interesting cases, but that was the rank and file of our work. After discharge uh, from the Air Force, did you come immediately to Farmington? Yes, it was really peculiar. I was wanting to get back into Carlsbad, which is where I grew up, of course, and my family wanted me there. But doors weren't opening like I had hoped for. Kendall Schlinker, a classmate of mine, had come up here to Farmington and gone to work with Jim Cooney, who at that time was a city attorney here in Farmington and um, he said uh, what are you going to do and I told him of my frustrations and he said come up and meet Jim and if you guys hit it off come to work with us we need somebody and so I did that and Jim and I not only hit it off we made a bet on the World Series that was happening very quickly after that and I came to work here my first day of work was October the 1st 1959. And you worked uh, in the office of Cooney and Schlinker? Yes, I did. And uh, my specific uh, tasks included uh, prosecuting the cases at the city court, uh, which uh, Jim had the responsibility for as a city attorney. He didn't work full time for the city attorney. He uh, had his own practice and did the, the work. How long did Kendall stay with the firm? He was uh, with us until about 1962 at which time he went off to um, New York University Law School to get his concentration in law in um, tax law. And then back to Albuquerque, I assume. Yes, that's right. Uh, I think it, he has maintained an association with, with you or with the firm even to, to date, has he? Well, uh, certainly that of close friends. Uh, that's the reason I came to Farmington was because I thought so much of Kendall and Wilda, his wife, and the, and the children he had. But uh, yeah, they're, they're very special friends of mine. Um, Jim Cooney was a perfect boss, but he was uh, a real independent individual, wasn't he? Well, yes, he was. Um, a wonderful mentor in the law, though. He was a brilliant person, and uh, I learned an awful lot from him. Any special stories about Jim that you might share with us? <laughs> um, I got a case once where my client had been accused of shooting five head of deer out of season, of course, and, and uh, without license. And I was sharing that problem with D Jim, and you know, he was shaking his head, and about 30 minutes later, he came r almost running down the hall at me saying, I've got your defense. I said, what is that? Self-defense. <laughs> <laughs> After, uh, did you stay a, a partner of Jim's until he died? No. Um, let me say that um, Jim and I shared offices, um, as you know, over at 811 West Apache at the time that I left him to go downtown Farmington. What had happened was that our practices were so busy and we had started bringing in help other lawyers. And in fact, we moved in a mobile office and sat it parallel to our office building, 
where we house some of the lawyers. And um, eventually I said to Jim, you know, I think this is uh, entirely too onerous and I'm going to leave and go downtown. And he, he agreed. He said that that makes a lot of sense. So um, I left and then he died a few years later. Uh, not very long after that, but uh, he did. One of the uh, wonderful stories about Jim Cooney is um, the incredible work he did for the city of Farmington as city attorney. He and uh, Mayor Fouts uh, were instrumental in bringing a lawsuit against the trustees of the Basin Light and Power Company which had been established ostensibly for the benefit of the city of Farmington or the town of Farmington and then. And uh, it became so um, profitable for those trustees of the city that they wouldn't turn it over to the city. And so this lawsuit was to get that done and, and they accomplished it. So, and, and that utility is now a municipal utility. That's right. That's the city of Farmington utility system. Which, if people don't know, serves not only Farmington, but a good part of northwest New Mexico. Yes, that's right. Uh, after uh, your association with Jim and when you moved downtown, uh, did you form other partnerships? Yes, I've had a number of uh, associates and partners over the years, Dick. Um, uh, Gary Harrell uh, was probably the first one, and then uh, uh, Don Wills and David uh, Petard. Ralph Odenwald, Karen Vandiver, um, we, um, we were all together at one time and again kind of a, <laughs> a big group for a small office downtown but nevertheless uh, we had a good time and enjoyed ourselves. Ultimately uh, uh, you were lucky enough to have members of your family join you I think. Yes I did. Um, before he went on the bench uh, Byron Caton came to practice with me for a while. I'd, I'd left him out, but then when uh, my son Tom graduated from law school, he came to practice with me in Farmington, but he always wanted to live in Albuquerque, and he was running back and forth every weekend uh -huh. to see the Lobos play, to see a girlfriend or whatever, and he said when Paul finishes law school and is with us for a year, I'm going to move, and that's what happened, and then Paul, his brother, has been with me, um, you know, for about 12 years now, I think it is. In your career, uh, in th those many associations, are there any cases or representations that uh, you're particularly proud of? Yeah, I am. Uh, and it's hard to single out cases. Um, frankly, a couple of them that I have uh, been involved with have been against you and in all due respect you have been one of my favorite lawyers uh, to litigate against because I knew I was going to be in for a, a real battle and uh, you'd be well prepared and I had to be therefore. But um, the case that we tried involving my client who was seeking to get his property back from your client who was then deceased I thought was particularly good one because um, my client won and he saved his home which was really the most incredible thing that uh, I thought he was like 85 years old and uh, the expression um, an old man cry that that applied to my client at that time. I tried one one time that um, involved uh, the most complex set of uh, people and their emotions toward each other, but it was an estate. I got called over to Blanco School one day and um, the family was gathered after the funeral and I didn't know them, but we went into a classroom and the, after I met them all, the first thing that happened was um, there were nine children. Eight of them pointed to the oldest one and said, you get out of the room. And he, said he wouldn't go, but they said, yes, you're going to go. And, and I mean, they were serious, and he left, but he was walking back and forth. And I could see him in the little window in the door. I asked, what was the reason behind that? I said, is he an in-law or something? No, he's the oldest one. So what's the deal? So, well, Mother always maintained that 
uh, dad was not the father of the uh, oldest child. At least uh, my, my dad maintained that, they said, not, not mother, but dad maintained that he was not the father. And by golly, he can't have any of this estate. <laughs> <Oops>. <laughs> and so that was, the, that was the start of a very interesting uh, uh, case that uh, uh, before it's all over, they brought him back in because he was the oldest. They made him the personal representative of the estate. <laughs> well, I think, Drew, that's probably back in the days where there was an irrebuttable presumption of uh, legitimacy. Isn't yeah, that's right. And then another one that you were on the other side of, along with many other lawyers, was one involving my client who lost a leg at a well site explosion. And we won that case. And uh, that was particularly um, good because um, my client uh, was able to uh, enjoy some things in his life that he'd never been able to before. And uh, that was one of the the best cases to try that I can remember being involved in, uh, particularly because uh, the major defendant, which was not your client, had offered to settle way below what we wanted and what a jury in a similar case in Albuquerque had agreed to pay, I mean, came in uh, with a verdict on, and we were able to beat that even. So it was a particularly wonderful result, not only for my client, but for the lawyers uh, representing my client, myself and David Batard. How about uh, interests other than the law? We've talked some about your family, but what about uh, hobbies or outside interests? I've always been a sports fan. I love to go to high school, college sports. Uh, and bet uh, on it. And, yeah, and bet <laughs> on it. <laughs> That's right. Uh, uh, and speaking of that, I've always enjoyed um, craps and blackjack, which I uh, can't get enough of even today, probably. But the interest wanes as you get older, of course. But um, we, Vi and I, read quite a bit. Uh, and uh, we're very involved in our church and in our family, of course. Yeah. And how many kids do you have? I have five, three sons and two daughters. And of the th three sons, I believe you said two of them are practicing law? Yes, they are. And my third one works at Rio Rancho for Intel. And you have two stay-at-home mothers and um, your daughters? Well, um, Ramona... Oh, I'm sorry. You have a teacher on a stay-at-home. Yeah, Ramona is a teacher of uh, special education. She's got a master's degree in special ed and teaches at uh, Animus Elementary in Farmington. She took time out and was a stay-at-home mother until her husband became disabled and had to stay home, and she went to work a couple of years ago again. And Jerry, our older daughter, uh, lives in Midland, Texas, has three of our, of our 11 grandchildren. And uh, she is um, a graduate of UNM and has not put her uh, degree to work in a job other than to help her husband who is a physician, and she helps him with his business end of the practice. Tell me about bar activities other than the professional side of law. I think you've been very active as a member of the state bar and the Supreme Court committees in your career. Uh, yes, and I think that is um, such a wonderful part of my life, really. I've enjoyed them so much. I served uh, six years on the disciplinary board I came off of that in about 92, 1992, um, I, and I have served um, more recently and still am serving on the, ju the Judicial Performance Evaluation Commission. I'm one of the uh, people who was appointed by uh, Chief Justice uh, Gene Franchini when the um, JPEC was formed uh, in 1997. And so I'm on my 12th year. And uh, the Supreme Court has asked me to stay one more year to help um, mentor the uh, new, what would now be a co-chair. So uh, uh, that's the highlight of the involvement of my, uh, you know, career as far as the state bar is concerned. For those of you, who, those who are listening to this that don't know, uh, JPEC demands uh, an incredible investment of time uh, during certain parts of every year, does it not? It does, Dick. We, um, except for a few exceptions, we meet every month um, 
when we're really busy, we're interviewing judges all over the state uh, to make recommendations to the voters on whether to retain those judges when they stand for retention election. And um, it involves doing a lot of preparation, reading. It involves leading interviews of judges when we interview them, uh, digesting data that is compiled by research and polling from questionnaires that we've sent out. We've also visited um, um, courtrooms to observe judges, although that's been several years ago because now we use um, paid people to do that because the judges recognize us when we come in and you know <laughs> the behavior is not uh, something that we can count on at that point in time. You know? Uh, in other words, you have uh, a mystery shopper. Yes, that's uh, right. Appearing exactly. in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. uh, just to get away from uh, uh, yourself and the history, uh, in your own words, um, I'm going to put you on the spot. Can you tell us what you think that your legacy to the bar will be, or you would like it to be? Well, I guess um, I would like it to be that I was a uh, model of honesty and professionalism and good ethics. Um, if, if that can be said of me at my funeral, it'll be perfect. I, I just don't think of anything else that, uh, that I would like. Lastly, what do you see happening with regard to the practice of law in the future? In Along with that, do you have any specific words of wisdom that you would pass on to younger members of the bar who may view this or listen to it? Dick, um, considering that in, um, when I came to Farmington in 1959, we were using carbon paper, <laughs> mimeograph uh, machines, and um, didn't have copy machines uh, or you know, uh, automatic typewriters or um, computers, we have come so far that it is incredible to foresee or try to foresee what might be 50 years from now. I mean, I just can't imagine what else there is out there um, in the wings. But as far as um, the future, I have to believe that it's always going to depend upon the good professionalism of our profession. And I guess if I were advising young lawyers, it would be, as I do today, that they um, always treat others um, fair, fairly, and that they will um, be honest in their uh, work and how they handle people, uh, because it's important that your word be your bond. And um, so I would say to my sons, and I have said, that um, they have to think twice before they send a letter that might have some um, things they might regret having said after the fact, and that they always deport themselves honorably in court and with other lawyers that they are dealing with in their cases. I think that's all. Uh, Felix, thank you for the time you've given. Uh, thank you for your service. Thank you for being the benchmark uh, of all attorneys in Farmington, New Mexico. Dick, uh, thank you so much. I, I would be remiss, though, if I didn't say before we leave how much I personally appreciate and the Judicial Performance Evaluation Commission appreciate it deeply when you came forward to represent the commission when they were taken to court by one of the judges that we were evaluating and you donated your time and helped us in the Supreme Court uh, and I tell you that was very special. Thank you. Thank you.